We kept that as a secret. Yay, buddy. We kept that as a secret from Bobby for a little bit. Hey, buddy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach him how to be a preacher. Hey, buddy, it's all right. I'm going to be right here. I'm going to be right here. I'm going to be right here. So we kept that from Bobby for a secret, and then I, I went to the store last week on payday to get food. And I came back, and I, and I, had, and I spent $200 on groceries. <laughs> and she said, you spent $200 on groceries. And Brett and I were meeting that day, and Brett goes, man, you've got a lot of groceries. <laughs> I said, well, it's a secret, but JP and Courtney are coming for Easter, so i got to buy it now. All right. So I, I had juice boxes and I hid them back in there so where she couldn't see them. <laughs> and she's like still freaking out. Like, you spent $200 on groceries. Until Courtney called the other day and got me off the hook. Said, hey, we're coming for Easter. And then I, Bobby punched me in the arm. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> she said, why didn't you spend 300 No, 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 no. That, but it's awesome to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ in evangelical churches we celebrate the resurrection every week right it's we wouldn't be here if there wasn't a resurrection Amen. right there is no reason to come at seven o'clock on a sunday morning or nine o'clock or ten o'clock or whenever it is you have church or people have church there's no reason to be here if there wasn't a resurrection what separates us though from other religions and other thinking right is this See, a lot of people put hope in George Washington because people put hope in George Washington thinking that if we have a better country, we'll have better people, right? And they put hope in Abraham Lincoln thinking that if we have a better, better president, make a better com country, make a better people. But George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are both dead this morning. They're good men, but they died because they were just like you and me. And people put... Years ago, hundreds, thousands of years, hundreds of years ago, anyway, they put uh, their hope in Alexander the Great, thinking, well, you know, if we can conquer the world, we'll have a better world. And Alexander the Great died young, and he's still dead. And then people put hope in uh, Lenin and Marx. I'm not going political on you, I'm just saying that people, people a hundred and some odd years ago put put hope in Lenin and Marx, thinking, you know, maybe they've got the right idea to a better person, a better place. And Lenin and Marx are still dead this morning. And so are the other religious leaders, and there's a multitude of them, but, but Buddha is still dead this morning, and, and Muhammad's still dead this morning, and Confucius is still dead this morning, but Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive this morning. And so we find out what God did and we find out why God did it in John 3 16 if you don't walk out of here with anything else walk out of here with this you already know this verse but the what we believe what we believe is in John 3 16 why we believe it is John 3 17 and that's all you need to know because if you know the why of what you believe nobody can take the what away Right? Nobody can trick you out of your what you believe because you know why you believe it. And I'm going to read it right out because it says this. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through Him would be saved. He didn't come hating on people. He came loving on people. Right? So the cross and the resurrection is how he did it. If John 3.16 is the what and John 3.17 is the why, the cross and the resurrection is the how. How did he do that? He did it through the sacrifice of Jesus. So the outcome of all of that was to fix what's wrong with us. We go, I mean, in America, there's nothing wrong with anybody. Okay? I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay, right? There's no, nothing wrong with anybody. But the reality is there is. So there's this, this sin problem that we have. And because there's a sin problem, there's a God problem. You go, well, you know, why couldn't God just say, well, it's all forgiven. Let's just keep going on. But God can't do that. You want to know what God can't do? People say, ah, can, God can't do this. God can't do that. Well, God can. But let me tell you what God can't do. God can't be unholy. 
God is holy, and He can't be unholy. Put it this way. The sun can't... I'm going to put it in a double negative. If you ever had an English course in high school, you would have flunked if you wrote this sentence. But God can't not be holy, because like the sun, the sun can't not be hot. Right? Water can't not be wet. And that's how God is holy. God is holy like the sun is hot, and like water is wet. That's how God is holy. Holiness then expresses itself in righteousness, rightness, right? Holiness expresses itself in love. Holiness expresses itself in peace. And that's who God is. And yet, because He's holy and He can't be unholy, in other words, because He can't be unholy, He can't have unholy things around Him. And because of a choice that Adam and Eve made, we got an inheritance that we kind of didn't want. You know, everybody hopes that, that, that someday some uncle's going to die and leave them an inheritance, right? And, and we got left an inheritance from our first grandparents, Adam and Eve, but it's an inheritance we really didn't want because it saddled us with something we can't get rid of. It's like a timeshare. You hear them talking about timeshares. And, and apparently a timeshare can be passed on to your children. How, did you, how does that happen? I don't know. But, but this thing that Adam and Eve passed on to us, we can't get rid of, except through Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. It separated Adam and Eve from God because they used to get together. And God said, well, because you did this, we, we can't have this close relationship like we had. I can't, I can't be with you the way that we have been, I've been with you. So I need a way to fix that. So sin was, there's a theological word for that. It's called imparted. Sin was imparted to us. What it means, it was passed down. It's passed down from generation to generation. It's like, you know, sometimes we get, you know, a grandfather will give a watch or something like that. You give that to your son, and you give that to your son, and you pass those things down. That's the same way sin was passed down to us from our grandparents, Adam and Eve. We're all inherited that, and we all are saddled with that. But God has a plan to fix that. And that plan is John 3, 16 and 17. He loved us, so he came looking for us. The cross is how Jesus did what he did, and he came to save mankind from our sin, and the resurrection is the proof of the power that he can back up what he says he's going to do. He can back it up. So I want to spend a lot of time giving you scriptures today. You didn't come to hear what I think. You came to hear the Word of God, so I'm going to give you the Word of God. And so with the Word of God, hopefully what you connect the dot is this. You can trust God for anything. You can trust Him with everything. And here's what He says. Romans 15, 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, we live in kind of a hopeless world, don't we? There are times you go, man, I just don't know how I'm going to get out of this hole. We see people who, who are living hopeless lives. And God put in writing, in His Word, He says, I'm the God of hope. And so when we're trusting in Him, we're going, I can trust in the one who proclaims Himself to be the God of hope. I don't have to hope that he can do something good. He says, you can trust me and, and you can hope in me. And so from that, if you are hopeless, God's put in writing. You can trust me for that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled. In other words, we got an inheritance that we really didn't want, you know. Some people go to a will reading really excited. Huh, there's something here for me. And you get a collection of hats. Or you get, you get that person's socks. You know, he always bragged about my socks. I'm leaving my sock collection to this guy, you know, right? Sometimes it's an inheritance you don't want. God's making a promise here. He's saying, this is an inheritance you'll want. Because it's an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though now you haven't seen him, you love him. 
And though you don't now see him, you believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. You know, God's saying, hey, you can, but you want to write, summarize that all down. God's going, you can trust me. Trust, do you trust me? Do you trust me with all this stuff? Because you can trust me. I am trustworthy. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness with those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We can trust him because it is the power of God. Did I lose anybody? I got one still. <laughs> the problem we have is, is death. And, you know, funerals are sad for a reason. Funerals are sad. Now, not all funerals are, are sad because sometimes we know that the one who has, has died is in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To be absent with the body, it says, is to be present with the Lord. And so there's great hope in that. And we can trust God for that because someday we will be with him in paradise, right? in, in heaven, with him, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But death is sad because you can't sit down and have a cup of coffee with that person again, right? You know, you can't sit around the table with granddad and grandma anymore because they've gone on, you know? And so death, what does death do? If you summarize that, death separates us from that loved one. And that's why death is sad because you can't sit down and enjoy time with them anymore. And that's how God looks at it as well. Remember, God's holy. He can't be unholy because he can't be unholy and we are unholy because we've inherited the sin problem from Adam and Eve and because we inherited the sin problem from Adam and Eve it makes us unable to be holy unless we get a little help and so God's saying I got the help for you I've made a plan and that's what we're going to look at the rest of the way in order for us to be forgiven for our sin there has to be a sacrifice sin is a lot like debt We'll look at that in a second. The Old Testament, God used worship, and in worship, like we have worship, he had sacrifice of animals. And the sacrifice of animals were for the forgiveness of the sins. And there was various types of animals used at various times and to bring the forgiveness of sins into, into the people's lives. But Jesus' sacrifice, it says, was once and for all. We don't have to keep doing this all over and over again. He was fully God, and yet God wrapped him in skin, just like ours. And because he did that, he led a sinless life, and he alone could be our sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. So what is God? He is holy. What is the expression of holiness? Righteousness. What are we not because of sin? Righteous. And yet through Jesus Christ in writing, it's, God's backed it up in writing. He says, you can be righteous. And because we're righteous through Jesus Christ, we can be with God. That's the good news. It's real good. <laughs> Jesus' resurrection breaks the power of death because Jesus' resurrection proves he can override anything. There is hope for life beyond death. His sinless life allowed, us to be the allowed him to be the sacrifice to pay off our sin account. It's kind of like having a debt account. Anybody, anybody have a credit card you owe money on? Oh, good, I'm the only one. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> we celebrate resurrection because our sin debt was paid. It's just like having a credit card and somebody comes and pays off that credit card. Somebody comes and pays off a credit card that you owe money on, you're going you're gonna to go, hey now, <laughs> that's all right, right? If you have a car that you owe money on and somebody pays that off, you're going to do a happy dance. Right? Because I don't owe any money on a car anymore. If you have a house and you get that paid off, you're going to go to Chris Yaden's porch and do a happy dance like I did. 
when we got ours paid off. Well, we didn't pay it off. We sold it and paid off all our debt. And there really wasn't anything left. We started all over again. We were kind of born again when it came to that. <laughs> but it sure felt good not to owe anybody anything. I'm going to tell you that right now. And if you do pay off your house and you want to go to Chris's porch and dance, I used James Brown, I feel good. Because <laughs> I did feel pretty good. I knew that I would now. <laughs> but you know what happens? Sometimes we get, and this is the best example I can come up with. And you hear this, you hear this on the news. You hear about millennials. I mean, these people who are in the 20s and 30s have been to college. And they've got this huge college debt. And so now they've, they've got a job from which they went and got a college degree to go get the job, but they owe so much money on the college degree, they're going to be 65 before they get it all paid off. <laughs> oh, now the amens come out. <laughs> Revival's breaking out now. <laughs> See... <laughs> That was close. <laughs> but the de- see, the deal is, you know, if that's your, if, if you're paying on that and you know, I'm going to be old before I get that paid off. If that's your reality, think of it this way. That's the way sin is without Jesus Christ. That's the way sin is without Jesus Christ because he says you can't do enough good stuff. You can't do enough good stuff that's going to pay off what you inherited. That sin thing that you inherited, you can't do enough good stuff. There's not enough old ladies you can help across the street. Right? To pay off that sin debt. And thankfully, God says this. Even though we get to where sin could wear us out, God says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11, it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the good news about Jesus. It is the power of God at work for saving everyone who believes, to Jews first and also Gentiles or non-believers. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight, how God pays off our debt. This is accomplished from start to finish by one thing. It says faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. It is through faith that we connect ourselves. What is the faith? I trust God. I believe in Him. I trust God. And he's saying, that's what he wants to know. Do you trust me? Hope does not disappoint, it says. And as long as we're willing to hope in the right things. So God... What do we know about Jesus? Jesus told Philip, he said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Jesus came and wrapped himself in skin as, through the Son, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus won't disappoint because God won't disappoint. Jesus won't disappoint because God doesn't disappoint. He's loving and cares about our situation. He has all power and all authority to do something about our troubles. He has authority to redeem our lives from sin, and His authority credits our sin account. So no matter how bad it is, in other words, translation, no matter what we have done on earth, He says, if you believe in me, I I will pay that sin price for you because I've already done it. I just want to know do you believe in me? Do you trust me? Do you, do, do you understand who I am? See, sin does this. It reduces 
diminishes, messes up everything in our life. Sin diminishes everything in our life, and there's nothing in our life that sin hasn't diminished. That's why we get old. That's why some of us get wrinkles. It's certainly why some of us get gray hair. I don't think God created gray hair. I think that, I th I think that is actually part of the curse, and I'm not kidding on that, because the body will die. He says, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will die. You will die, die. You will die a spiritual death. You will die a physical death. And we begin to diminish because of sin from the day we're born. But because of the resurrection, Jesus is alive to make us be able to live forever. See, we'll die in this body. This body will fade away. There's a day appointed for this body to be no more on this earth. But our soul will live forever. Amen. Are you with me? Our soul will live forever forever. Say it with me. Our soul will live forever. Somewhere. Somewhere. Jesus is the hope that says our soul will live forever and always be with Him in heaven. We won't be separated anymore. Sin debt won't separate us from God anymore through Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 says this. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which, every, which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Matthew 28, 19 says, Jesus has all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So we can go directly to him and say, Lord, there is nobody higher I can go to. There's nobody else I can go to. You are my highest source. You're the only one who can really help me. Sometimes pray this. I pray this prayer. You don't have to pray it like this, but I pray this prayer. God, I want you to know that I know you're the only one that's going to help me out of this. I want you to know that I know because I'm not going to go to anybody else, Lord. Now, if you send somebody else my way, to help in this situation, that's called a resource. But God alone is our source for all things, right? So why is this important? Well, it's like this. If you're in a hopeless situation, you can go to Jesus and say, I trust you to get me out of this. How do you know? What's another way you can trust him? Because Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, He was tempted in every way just like we are. Hebrews 4.16 says, He was tempted in every way, just like we are. Every way. And He remained sinless. So what's that mean? You ever gone out fishing with somebody? You go to the Gulf and you get a charter boat, right? And you get a charter boat with a captain who's well, a captain well seasoned. It's a closed circuit for Zach over there. A captain well seasoned. Because a captain well seasoned knows where all the fish are in the Gulf. You say, I want you to take me to where the fish are because I know you know where they're at. And when it says that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are, it means he knows how to get us through that stuff. Some of that stuff looks like it's unavoidable. But he says, I was tempted in every way, just like you. Just like you. So I know how to get you through that. Do you trust me to get you through it? Oh, I'm going to take you on a place. It's going to look like I have, you have no idea where I've taken you. Sometimes it looks like that. But if we trust him, say, I trust you because it says you were tested just like I, I am tempted in every way. So we know we can trust him with our problems, with our concerns, our worries, our issues, because he's been tempted in every way just the like way we have. Everything we face, he's faced. And he remains sinless. Therefore, I think he's proven himself, right? Do you think he's proven himself with that? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want you to take me somewhere, God. Take me where I... Help me here in this. Romans 15.13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then this, we read this this morning. I want to read it again as we get ready to close up here. 1 Peter 1, 17 says this. Remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no 
favorites. If you ever, ever hear anybody say, oh, well, the Bible is for this group of people or that group of people, but it's not for this other group. Tell them they're wrong. Take them to this verse. 1 Peter 1.17, remember, the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do, so you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time as temporary residents. And fear, in that sense, is respect. Understanding who is. When you, you get with a charter boat captain, and you respect that he knows what he's doing. It's the same thing. You're respecting who he is because he's been there before. He can take you through. And that's what the Bible's saying here. When it says to fear him, it's to revere him, saying, I trust him. I, I trust him. Absolutely, I trust him. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. That sock collection that we, that we can't do anything with, right? This sin problem we inherited from Adam and Eve. It was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, He has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because He raised Christ from the dead and gave Him glory. Yeah? That's right. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart, for you have been born again. The debt has been paid off. You are debt-free in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are debt-free in Christ Jesus. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. When I was growing up, I was about 15, we had a preacher who was young and he was cool. And he used to say this line, I remember this all my life. He would preach and he would say, just remember Jesus is a gentleman. And he'd kind of point to us where all of us kids were sitting because we all sat together, strength in numbers. But we all sat together, and he would point down to us because he said, just remember, Jesus is a gentleman. He won't barge his way into your life. He'll knock. You've got to open that door. You've got to open the door. And so in that, he's saying, you, you're going to open the door for me. Will you open the door for me? Because if you open the door, see, the door is separating us. We, you, I can't be with you, and you can't be with me, but I will come in. In fact, where that picture up there is taken from is Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It says, if you'll open the door, I'll come in, and we'll sit down and have a meal together, is what that says. So he's into spending time with us. He says, I'll sit down and have a meal with you. But there's no handle on the outside, so if this door is opening, you have to open it. I'm not barging it in, because I won't do that to you. But will you, will you open the door? Because if you open the door, then I'll come in and, and, and we can be together. We can have fellowship together. And so that's what his question is to us today. You're going to open the door. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes. That's the key. With the head, we can speak it. Brett talked about this this morning at 7 o'clock. So if you were here at 7, you could hear this again. See, we can speak anything from our head, but our heart is where we really believe. Do you trust me in here? He's asking. Do you trust me enough to open your door? Will you open your door to me, he says? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes. And once we believe, it says, it results in righteousness. What can't God do? He can't be unrighteous. What can't we do? What, there's another double negative. If you're keeping notes on your scorecard, there's another double negative for you. What can't we do? We can't be righteous except through him. 
So through him, we're righteous. And then what was unrighteous now is righteous, and now we can be with him who is righteous all the time. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, it says in Romans. Ever been disappointed in someone? Someone tell you they're going to do something? And then they didn't back it up? Couldn't back it up? So I'll loan you the money. Comes time to loan you the money. Oh, I don't have the money. I'm a little disappointed. Right? He says in him, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. And there is no distinction. There's no distinction between, and I'll put it this way, there's no distinction between the races. He's calling it Jew and Greek. But that's what he's saying. There's no distinction between Jew and, and Greek. This isn't a white man's religion or a black man's religion or an Asian man's religion or Hispanic man's religion or, or an Indian's religion. This isn't all that. This is Jesus. God created all of us. There is no distinction. It's the same for all of us. What's the old line? Haven't heard this one in years either. The foot of the cross, the ground is always level. The ground is always for everyone. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is no distinction between race, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him for, remember this, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Say that with me. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He remakes us in His image. What does righteousness look like? Well, righteousness is... And there's not a good way to do this. So this is going to be incomplete, but it's the best I can do. Righteousness is loving and righteousness is joyful. Righteousness is peaceful. Righteousness is patient. Righteousness is kind and good and gentle and full of hope. Remember what the Bible said. He's the God of hope. He's the God of hope. He identifies himself as hope. We all, some of the... Who are the golfers in here? Steve's a golfer. David's a golfer. Anybody golf? Yeah, Steve's a golfer over here. Connie's a golfer. You guys ever taken a mulligan? Oh, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, you're in church. (laughs) Don't you wish life came with mulligans? If you don't play golf, a mulligan is, I get to do that shot over again. (laughs) Don't you wish life came with mulligans? Don't you wish, man, if I could go back in time... I would undo that, or I wouldn't do that. I would unsay that, or I would never say that. And what Jesus does, he gives you a mulligan. It's a permanent mulligan. He wipes the slate clean. The debt is wiped away. The slate is clean. And you can start all over again. I don't know everybody in here's heart God knows your heart but I'm gonna ask you a question and and you can bow your head and I'm bowing my head and closing my eyes too but I'm gonna ask you this you answer this honestly with yourself and say you know have I really ever believed in my heart have I have I told God I believe in him have I told God I totally believe you are the one and only salvation, that Jesus is my salvation. Have you told him that? Do you believe that? I guess you can't really tell him that unless you believe that. So the question is, do you believe it? And if you haven't done that, do it right now. Tell God, I believe that Jesus is the son who died for my sins and rose again. Tell him that. You can open your eyes. I didn't want to look. I didn't want you looking. I just wanted you to know that God says He will come into our heart. He will change us. He will change us and He'll make us like Him. He's trustworthy. Not only is He trustworthy, He's just plain worthy. He's just plain worthy. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our belief in Him. He's worthy to take the risk he's worthy to put our faith in there's a lot of things calling us to put our faith in the bank is saying put our faith in them we'll we'll help you with that a lot of people say you can trust in me but jesus is the only one that we can really trust in and and he just wants to know 
you know, open the door. I'll come in. You trust me? Things will never be the same. Because I'll pay off all that stuff you're carrying. You don't have to carry that anymore. I'll make it all clean for you. So it can change life here. Let me be the last to tell you that things will always be perfect when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You see what I'm saying there? You see what I did there? Let me be the last to tell you because it isn't going to be that way. We all have troubles and trials. And we just looked at the scripture that says we'll go through troubles and trials. And why do we do that? Sometimes it's the only way God can prove to us he is everything he says he is. And it's hard to do, but he brings us through. He said, I'll bring you through. You can trust me. But it doesn't promise us that everything will be perfect always because it won't. It won't. However, what it does mean is that there's something that changes, and I can't explain it to you. I don't have the words to explain it to you. Maybe there's guys that can explain it to you, but I can't. All I can tell you is there's something that happens on the inside. And where there was despair before, all of a sudden there's joy. Because there's something peaceful inside going on. I can't explain it, but I know God's there. Anybody ever had that feeling? Yeah. So it means life here can have peace, and we can be joyful even when things are going wrong. Not joyful in the stuff, but joyful that our God is never going to leave us and forsake us if we open that door. He's not going to walk away from us. So, and it also means this, that our life beyond here, in eternity, we will forever be with Him because we will live beyond the grave. He rose, we sang that song last week, and I love the line in that song, if He came up out of that grave, we're coming out too. If he walked out of the grave, we're walking out too. It's my new favorite line of every, any song out there right now. If he walked out of that grave, we're walking out too. In him. In him. This morning, it, it, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you today accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord for the first time, before you leave today, tell somebody. Come tell me. Steve's granddaughter, Sayla, this morning. Steve, share that real quick. Would you mind? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. I like that. Well, if you've passed the Savior test, you can have communion with us this morning. Celebrate what he's done with us. You don't have to be a member of our church to have communion with us. And I'm going to have Brett come forward. We're going to do this a little bit differently this morning, but it's, it's a, a wonderful way to celebrate the, the Lord's Supper.